Hello, Journey. Wow, so good to see you with us today. Welcome. We're glad to have you in Apopka. We want to welcome those at Lake County. We always want to welcome our uh, family at our Lake County campus, and we want to welcome those that are joining us online right now from so many different places. So thank you for being here. If this is your first time here, maybe your first time back in a while, it's so good uh, uh, to see you. Hey, uh, this uh, week, I believe November 11th, uh, is, is Veterans Day, and I want to make sure that we as a church express our appreciation to the men and the women who have served in our military and who are serving right now. So would you do that with me right now? Let's express appreciation to all those who have served. Lake County, would you do that as well? And, and online. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, today we begin a new series of messages called Kingdom Nomics. And we're going to talk about something that you don't like to hear talked about in church, but you talk about it, and you think about it, and you worry about it all the time. And you know what it is, right? Money. In fact, I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I feel pretty confident in saying this. Many of you here in Apopka or Lake County or joining us online sometime this past week had a concern had a casual conversation, or maybe even a contentious discussion on the subject of money. Marriage counselors tell us that money, who earns it, who spends it, who overspends it, and who decides what to do with it is one of the most common conflict points in relationships. And yet, when people come to a church service like this, some get upset whenever we talk about money. And if that describes you, Here's probably why you think that. You probably think whenever the church talks about money, it's because it wants my money. (laughs) Right? That's why you think that. I love the story about two men who crashed in a private plane on a tiny South Pacific island. They survived, and one of the men brushed himself off and proceeded to run all over the island to see what their prospects of survival were. When he returned several hours later, he rushed up to the other man and he screamed, this island is uninhabited, there's no food, there's no drinking water, we're going to die. The other man leaned back against the debris of the wrecked plane, folded his arms and responded, no, we're not, I'll make over $250,000 a week. First man grabbed his friend and he shook him, he said, did you hear what I said? We're on an uninhabited island, there's no food, no safe drink, we're going to die. The other man unruffled. He responded, no, we're not. I'll make over $250,000 a week. First man taken aback with that arrogant answer repeated, for the last time, I'm telling you, we're doomed. There's no one else on this island. There's no food. There's no drinking water. We are, I repeat, going to die a slow death. Still unfazed, the other man looked his butt in the eyes. He said, don't make me say this again. I make over $250,000 a week. I'm a Christian. I'm a member of a church. I tithe off everything I make. Trust me, my pastor will find us. (laughs) Now, let me sincerely acknowledge up front that the church has not always handled conversations about money well and not always with pure motives. We've heard stories about exorbitantly paid pastors and lavish lifestyles led by some high-profile Christian leaders, and that makes all of us who love the Lord and the local church cringe. And yet, in spite of the perception that the church has ulterior motives when it talks about money, I want to suggest that we come at this topic in a little different way. I don't think the church has ulterior motives when it comes to money as much as it has inferior methods in helping people understand just how much God's Word has to say about money and how God's economy operates. I think the reality is the church doesn't talk about money, uh, talk enough about money, I should say, and how to manage it with a kingdom perspective. Now, whether you agree with that or not, here's one thing we know for sure. Jesus certainly talked a lot about money and possessions. Why is that? Why did Jesus say more about money than he did about heaven and hell combined? Considering everything else that he could have told us about things that we need to know, 
Why does one-sixth of the Savior of the world's recorded words and over one-third of his parables that he told talk about money? What did Jesus know about money and possessions that we don't? Well, Jesus understood that money is more than a source of coins and currency. It's a means of shaping our character. Jesus understood that money has an inherent power that can be used for good or for evil. It can be a powerful force for expanding the kingdom of God, or it can be a powerful force for destroying people's lives. Jesus knew that. And Jesus knew that the use of money is the clearest indication of the place the kingdom of God has in a person's heart. Because your heart is always present wherever your treasure is put. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So he talked a lot about money. Jesus once said this. He said, no one can serve two masters. And the options he gave were not God and Satan. He said, you can't serve God and money. Because he knew that money has the greatest potential to become our God substitute. Listen, Jesus wasn't trying to get money out of your pockets. He's trying to get idols out of your heart. Jesus' mission was not to make money. His mission was to make disciples. And that's the mission of Journey Christian Church, to make disciples of Jesus who love God, love people, and serve the world. So for the next several weeks, we're going to talk about money. And it's really not a stewardship series as much as it is a discipleship series because disciples are called to reshape their values and realign their priorities to embody to embody the economic principles of a new kingdom. Followers of Jesus have been called into a new dominion. We have a new master now, and that's why we practice something called kingdomnomics. And each week, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you a basic principle of understanding the economy from a kingdom perspective. And today's lesson is kingdomnomics 101. Are you ready? Kingdomnomics 101, God owns all. Everybody say that with me right now. God owns all. To understand anything about money from a kingdom perspective, we have to start right here. The consistent voice of the scripture writers makes it clear that throughout nearly every biblical book that God has the absolute right to all things because he is the creator, he's the sustainer, and he's the redeemer of all things. Listen to what David said in Psalms 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Listen to what Moses said, to the Lord your God belongs the heavens and the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Most of all, listen to what God said to his suffering servant Job, who has a claim against me that I must pay, God said. Everything under heaven belongs to me. I want to show you a a passage from Psalms 50 that makes a particularly powerful point on this matter. This is God speaking in Psalms 50. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. In other words, not just the dog belongs to God, the ticks belong to God. (laughs) If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world is mine and all that is in it. Now, in a message from a few weeks back, I said, if you're a parent, you quickly realize one of the first words your child learns to say is mine. And the reality is, we did not teach them that word. We taught them how to say daddy. We taught them to say how, we we taught them to say mommy or potty. Side note, just a a, a side note here. My youngest grandson is named Brian, and he's had a bit of a speech delay. No learning disabilities, cognitive issues. He just didn't, he just didn't want to talk. I mean, the little guy is very perceptive. He took in everything going on around him. He just never tried to speak much until lately. I called my daughter, Anna, a few weeks ago. Bryant was sitting on her lap. He heard my voice, and he said, hi, pap. (laughs) Now, the other grandsons called me pappy, but I was thrilled to hear even half of it from Bryant. (laughs) Melinda, my wife, was sitting nearby, and I said, can you say hi, Mimi? Because I thought... If he says hi, Pap, without saying Mimi, it's not going to be a good night in the Hampton household. (laughs) 
And thankfully, the little guy played along and he said, hi, Meme. Not Mimi, but again, we'll take what we can get. But let me tell you, what no one's teaching that little guy to say is mine. That will come soon enough without any prompting. Very early on in life, we see a battle shaping up over who the owner is. But the reality is this. God is the only one who can rightly say about anything and everything, mine, because God owns all. This is a top-button truth. You know what that means? Let me tell you a story to illustrate. Bob Benson was asked to speak at his son's graduation. Bob Benson went out, bought a new suit with a vest, and he spoke at the graduation, and afterwards one of his son's friends said, that was a great talk tonight, Mr. Benson, but you might want to check your vest. It's not button right. And Benson looked down, and sure enough, the first button wasn't button. Instead, the second button was where the first button ought to be, and the whole thing was just cockeyed and crooked. And Benson compared life to buttoning a vest. If you get the top button right, the rest falls into place. If you get the top button wrong, every other button that follows is messed up. So when I say God owns all, this is a top button truth. And what I mean is this. If you don't get the issue of ownership right, every single thing you believe about stewardship is going to be wrong. Now, I've been doing this long enough. And I realize I haven't said anything yet with which you disagree if you claim to be a follower of Jesus. I'm I'm not going to get an angry email or see an outraged social media post about saying God owns all. Of course we know that, Pastor John. On a surface level, every believer in God at least acknowledges that God owns all. But that's part of the problem. We keep it on a surface level. But now we're going to enter the danger zone this morning, and we're going to dig a little deeper because I believe there's some very powerful and personal implications of Kingdomnomics 101. And here's the first one. We are not self-sufficient beings. We are not self-sufficient beings. This is important because one of the dangers of saying mine a lot is that it feeds the myth of individual autonomy. There's a Hollywood classic movie starring one of my favorite actors of all time, Jimmy Stewart. The movie's called Shenandoah. The setting of the movie is Jimmy Stewart plays a widower who owns a large ranch during the time of the Civil War. He's not much of a churchgoer, but his deceased wife was. He knew she would want him to take their children to church. He wasn't much for praying, but he knew his wife would want him to pray, especially before the big Sunday meal. With that setting, take a look at this clip. Lord, we cleared this land. We plowed it, sowed it, and harvested. We cooked the harvest. It wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be eating it if we hadn't done it all ourselves. We work dog bone hard for every crumb and morsel, but we thank you just the same anyway, Lord, for this food we're about to eat. Amen. Now listen, take a look at this. When God gives us the capacity to earn, it can quickly become our propensity to take credit. Now you didn't hear that. So I'm going to say it again. When God gives us the capacity to earn, it can quickly become our propensity to take credit. And God knows this about our hearts. So, for example, when God is preparing the nation of Israel to cross the Jordan to go into the promised land, look at what he says to them in Deuteronomy chapter 8. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. The worldview of the scripture writers completely rejects that any of us have the sufficient self-sustaining ability to exist independent of the benevolence of God. All that we have 
And all that we are is derived. You see, when you and I get something good, we think we've arrived. But the reality is all we have is derived. Let me explain. I've told you before that I read uh, one chapter of the Psalms every day. Usually read it out loud and often with my wife, Melinda. The last verse in the last chapter of that wonderful book of worship poetry says this. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Everybody read that with me right now. Lake County online, let's read it together. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Now, everybody, I want you to take a nice, big old, deep breath right now. If you can take a breath right now, you should be thanking God because that's his air you're breathing. Now, we never think about that. Many of us thank God for the moments that take our breath away, but we never stop to thank God that we can take a breath. Do you know the process of breathing is the result of a truly remarkable process? Oxygen comes into our lungs through an immensely complicated physiological process. That air is turned into something that our blood can take to parts of our body for fuel and energy. But it also produces a dangerous toxin called carbon monoxide that has to be expelled from our body. So our lung gets rid of that carbon, uh, di- uh, carbon dioxide, I should say, not monoxide, carbon dioxide, when we exhale and takes in more oxygen when we inhale. Did you know the average person does that 23,000 times a day? It's so amazingly automatic. It's so consistently reoccurring, we don't even think about it unless we get a respiratory disease like COVID. But it's God's air. What are we just saying? It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. And one day, God is going to say, that's enough. No more of my air. And you and I will take our last breath. And the myth that so many people believe that you're an independent creature will be clearly exposed. Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin was the first human being to ever enter outer space back in 1961. The communist Soviet dictator at the time, Nikita Khrushchev, is reported to have boasted after his orbit, Gagarin flew into space but didn't see any God there. To which W.A. Criswell, a prominent Baptist preacher in Dallas, Texas at the time, replied, if he'd have taken off that spacesuit, he would have seen God. Let me tell you something. Five seconds after you die, you're going to know exactly whose heir it was. So the Psalms end with this reality check. If you can breathe, praise God. Now listen, when we get this, we cannot help but worship, pour out our praise. And when we don't get it, we cannot help but worry. And the reason we worry is because we think we're the owners. We worry about what's mine and how it's threatened by things we can't control. Worrying about money is a primary reason many of us don't sleep well. I heard about a man who was up pacing the bedroom floor about 2 a.m. His wife woke up and asked what was bothering him. He said, you know, George, next door, I borrowed $1,000 from him. I got to pay it back tomorrow. and I don't have it. His wife got up, opened their bedroom window, and shouted, George, George. Finally, their groggy neighbor heard her, and he got up and opened the window. He said, what is it? She said, you know that $1,000 my husband owes you tomorrow? He said, yeah, he doesn't have it. And the wife put the window down, told her husband, now you come back to bed, let him walk the floor. We will never be free of worry until we become convicted and convinced that God owns all, that he is a good God, and he can do more than all we can ask or imagine, and he will keep his promise to provide for us. But that also means that we agree with God's distribution 
of what he owns. So here's a second implication of Kingdomnomics 101. We should not resist or resent what God wants to do with what's his. One of the great statements of Christian community is to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. But have you ever noticed it's much easier to weep with those who weep than to rejoice with those who rejoice, especially if they're rejoicing about something they have that you don't have? One of the below the surface implications of Kingdomnomics 101 is that envy is really not your problem with other people. Envy is your problem with God. You're envious because you don't approve of how God has distributed what's his. One preacher told about his mom who tried to protect him from being envious of others by saying this. He said they grew up in a a, a home without a lot of means. Their family always drove older, used cars. He said whenever a nice, newer car would pull up beside him at a spotlight, his mother would say, I wish I had that car and that they had a better car. And his mom said, As long as you want them to have a better car, it's not coveting if you want their car. (laughs) Friends, when you understand God owns all, a spirit of resentment gets placed by a spirit of contentment because you start to be more grateful for what you do have and you start to be more mindful about why you have it in the first place. Why does God let you have whatever you have of what's his? It's certainly not to hoard it because God doesn't give us anything of his to hoard. God blesses you so you can be a blessing to other people. That's exactly what Paul's talking about in his second letter to the Corinthian church. He says, you will be enriched, meaning blessed, in every way so that you can what? Find more ways to spend it, indulge ourselves and spoil our children, insulate ourselves from the wildly erratic economic shifts we see today. Not quite. So that You can be generous on every occasion, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Listen to me. Abundance isn't God's provision for me to live more extravagantly. Abundance, it's God's provision for me to give most generously. God entrusts me with his money not to build my kingdom on earth, but to allow his kingdom to come to earth. Can I tell you a neat story that's been happening for the last several weeks at our cafe here at the Apopka campus? An anonymous person has started giving $20 to our servers and tells them to share it forward. That person is paying up to $20 for other people's purchases from the cafe. Isn't that cool? In fact, when that person couldn't make it here one Sunday, they gave the $20 to someone else to bring to the cafe. That simple act of generosity inspired me with an idea for our year in giving I want to share with you right now. What if we could take up in our year in giving initiative during the month of December all of our missions and benevolence that we will give away next year? What if we paid our missions forward for 2022? What if all the money that we give to missions, both local and global, and benevolence to help people in need, we collected during the month of December, that would be like a first fruits offering for 2022? You say, what's a first fruit offering? First fruit offerings in the Bible is giving the first portion of the crops and the flocks that you raise back to God before you get the rest of it. What if we did that for all of our missions giving for next year? You may be thinking, how much are we talking about? I'm so glad you asked. (laughs) We're planning and praying about giving a total of about $500,000 away to our mission partners and on mission trips and mission projects and in benevolence for people in crisis and for serve day projects. That's more than 10% of what we expect our 2022 ministry budget to be. Can you imagine what that would do? All missions would be fully funded in advance. Cash flow for our campuses would be greatly improved when you take $500,000 out of it. And most importantly, more and more people will come to know and praise God through our generosity, which is exactly what Paul's talking about here. God blesses our work so that we can bless God's work. 
the work that he's doing all over the world right now. And when we understand this, we don't resent that we have to give. We rejoice because we get to give. When you begin to understand God owns all, you start asking different questions. You don't ask how much of my money should I give. We start to wrestle with how much of God's money should I keep. That leads us to the third and final implication of Kingdomnomics 101. We don't give to God as much as we return to God. We don't give to God as much as we return to God. I'm going to illustrate this concept to you like this. If you were my neighbor, and one day I came over and said, can I borrow a drill and a ladder? You being a good neighbor would, of course, say, yes, pastor, let me get that for you. Of course, if you were a really good neighbor, you would say, let me take care of that for you, pastor. <laughs> because you know your pastor is mechanically challenged and could do great damage to himself and his property, and the pastor's wife would rise up and call you blessed. But that's a whole nother sermon. <laughs> When I'm done with your tools, and if I don't bring them back to you in a timely manner, and you were to have that awkward conversation of asking me about them, what if I were to say to you something like this? Oh, yes, I have a drill and a ladder I want to give you. I'm so blessed to be able to do that. And here you go. And by the way, you're welcome. You know what you say? You say, Pastor, Actually, you didn't give me a drill and a ladder. You brought back to me what I already owned and let you use in the first place. You see the difference? If it's your possession, I can bring it to you. I cannot give it to you. Do you really give somebody something that never left their possession in the first place? This was the principal point behind a practice in the Bible called tithing. Tithing comes from a Hebrew word that literally means the tenth part or one-tenth. The practice of tithing is giving 10% of my income back to God. And I mention that because sometimes people will throw the word tithe around loosely. Somebody might say something like this, I think I'll tithe $10 this week. Well, in case you're a little mathematically challenged, if $10 were a literal tithe, that means your actual income is $100, and it may very well be that that's your actual income for the week. But for most of us, I seriously doubt that's the case. Tithing means 10%. The Scripture writers, particularly in the Hebrew Scriptures, talked a lot about tithing. Moses wrote a lot about it in the laws of Israel, but it goes back further than Moses. Abraham tithed to a strange king named Melchizedek. Why? Abraham and Moses and the children of Israel tithed 10% to let God know that they know he owns 100%. And that's why tithing in the Bible is never treated as an act of generosity. It's always treated as an act of obedience. The Scripture writers never say, give the tithe. The Scripture writers say, bring the tithe. Over and over in the Old Testament, we see statements like this, a tithe of everything from the Lord, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. It's like God is saying, I want to teach you a fundamental financial law of how the kingdom economy operates, so you regard the tithe, the first 10%. percent does not even belong to you. It's mine. This gets reflected in the language the Bible uses about handling our tithes. This is from 2 Chronicles, talking about Israel. They brought a great amount, a tithe of everything. The people of Israel and Judah who lived in the towns of Judah also brought a tithe of their herds and flocks and a tithe of the holy things dedicated to the Lord, and they piled them up in heaps. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to let you in on a little pastoral secret right now. I've never preached on tithing that I don't get some pushback. And sometimes some nasty, angry pushback. And the pushback primarily comes like this. Well, that's Old Testament law, Pastor. We're New Testament Christians. Don't try to put the guilt of that law works righteousness on us who live under grace. Can I tell you another little secret I've discovered about people in churches over the years? who want to set up this false dichotomy of giving under law as opposed to giving under grace, here it is. They are usually not looking for how they can be more generous. 
They're actually using the grace of Jesus to negotiate a lesser standard than the law of Moses. They're basically arguing, since Jesus paid it all, I don't have to give much. Pastor Tim Keller put it best. He said, it makes no sense at all to imagine that God would have higher standards for his Old Testament people than he would for his New Testament people, who have far greater privileges. Think, Keller says. Have we received more of God's revelation, truth, grace than Old Testament believers or less? Are we more debtors to grace than they were or less? And here's the kicker. Did Jesus tithe his life and blood to save us or did he give it all? And this gets us to the heart of what Kingdomnomics 101 is really all about. If you're a Christian and a follower of Jesus, you have the spiritual DNA of Jesus. That means giving is in the blood that bought your freedom. That's what Paul meant when he wrote, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Jesus talked so much about money, not because he was about making money, but because he was all about making disciples. And discipleship starts with a question of ownership. And this is discipleship 101. Jesus owns me. Jesus owns me. My friend Rick Atchley says he likes to think of this like this. He says he is pre-owned, meaning that God knit him together in his mother's womb. He literally made him. But Rick says he also says he's tree-owned. Because in my rebellion and rejection of God, God pursued me in the person of Jesus. And Jesus hung on a tree for my sins. And he took the blame for everything I've ever done wrong. And he gave me credit for everything he ever did right. And that makes me right with God. Friends, Jesus owns me. And if he owns me, doesn't it follow that he owns everything that I have? The real issue is not how or even how much we support our church or other ministries. The real starting point when we talk about kingdomnomics is surrendering to the king. A pastor from Romania was talking with a well-known American pastor who came to visit his country after the Iron Curtain of Communism collapsed more than 30 years ago. The Romanian pastor said this to the American pastor. He said, you American Christians are big on commitment. To which the American pastor said, that's a good thing, isn't it? The Romanian pastor said, not really. Because commitment is the word that you use to replace the word surrender. He went on to explain, you like commitment because you stay in control. You can commit to going to church. You can commit to reading your Bible. You can commit to exercising every day or eating better or making car payments. But make no mistake about it, you're in control This Romanian pastor who'd been through so much persecution said this, when someone knocks your door down, points a gun at your head, you don't tell them about what you're committed to. You surrender. Friends, Jesus is very clear on this point. There is no way to follow Jesus that does not involve complete and total surrender. And so he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. We American Christians like commitment because we stay in charge, but we are called to surrender to our master and king. And surrender is not when you give up something. Surrender is when you give up everything. That's why Paul tees up his longest and most profound appeal for an offering taken in the New Testament by saying this, they gave themselves First to the Lord. And when you get that top button truth right, everything else will follow. And that's what we invite you to do right now. Would you bow your heads with me in Apopka and Lake County and online? Father, I just uh, want to take a moment. And even as I take in a breath right now, I just want to say, God, I pour out my praise. I just thank you for the breath that I can take, the air I can breathe. It's your air. Everything we have belongs to you. Everything we have is derived from what you put here, what you made, what you sustain, and what you've redeemed through the blood of Jesus. And one day it's all going to be restored. This earth, 
this good earth that you made that's been cursed by sin and rebellion. It's going to be made good. Our bodies, which sometimes have difficulty breathing or walking or remembering, they're going to be restored in the resurrection. Thank you that you made all that possible. It's your breath in our lungs. And we pour out our praise to you. And we say, God, you own it all. And you own us, Jesus. You bought us with a price. And I pray right now we would just understand that and let this kingdomnomic series start with acknowledging that truth again and again. God owns all. Jesus owns me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.